Amen. Well, we're glad you're here today. It's Resurrection Day. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, can I get a little more in the monitor? Just a little bit more in the monitor, just a tad bit more. Glory to God. We've been teaching on for a couple of weeks here the threefold anointing of Jesus and how it relates to us. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. For Christ is not entered into the holy place without made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear, that is his priestly ministry, in the presence of God for us. Nor yet should he offer himself often as the high priest um, entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then he must often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world he hath appeared, that was his prophet's ministry, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and we talked about this last week, that it's, that it's not a certain set time you die. Uh, we are going to die if Jesus doesn't come back, but you don't have a date. There's not a clock counting down, and when it strikes 12, you're out of here no matter what. That's just not scriptural. How do you know? Because uh, you can add or take away from your life depending on what you do. Just honoring your parents as a child can add length of days to you. It's the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, that thy days may be long on the earth. What's that mean? If you dishonor your parents, they'll be short. They won't ever be big. Hallelujah. Uh, to put away sin by himself, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Hallelujah. But unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time as king. Hallelujah. Without sin unto salvation. So we have the threefold uh, ministry of Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. His prophet's ministry was his earthly ministry. He operated in the supernatural. He ministered supernaturally. He came uh, to speak of, of the coming church age and to present it for, the church, for us to be able to receive uh, at that time. <clears throat> he, went, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He entered into his high priestly ministry. And so he now functions as the high priest uh, of our profession. Amen. And then he's coming back again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So last week we talked about, or the past couple weeks we talked about these different things. Let's, talk, let's start this morning. <clears throat> and it does relate to today. I know... Um, Somebody asked me we, yesterday, they saw me and said, uh, you having a sunrise service? I said, no. Nope. We found out, you know, you can have just as, just as wonderful a time with the Lord at 10 o'clock as you can at 6. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, you know, I don't know, I don't know if we have scripture for the fact that he got up at 6. <laughs> Hallelujah. It could have been 10. And so since it could have been, I took 10. I know since it was in the Middle East, <laughs> it's probably 12 or 3 over here. Hallelujah. So we won't be at Scripture. We'll be closer to the real time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, my church, we were, at, we were out of in Greenville. Uh, the Tar River runs down through Greenville, runs Rocky Mountain through Greenville, down through uh, Choc uh, Grimesland, down to Chocowin, out into the uh, Pamico Sound. And uh, actually at the uh, U.S. 17 bridge there in Chocowin, it becomes the, the, the Tar Pamico. It switches over and it becomes Pamico River. But we used to get up at our church, and our pastor, Pastor John, wanted to go down and have sunrise services at the river. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Hallelujah. I just decided when I pastored, I didn't have to have a river with cold, cold air and cold water and uh, fog and everything else to, to worship the Lord. I, I tell you, I've worshiped him a whole lot better next to my heater. And just say it. Tomorrow, we got, uh, the, the, I got, I'm doing a wedding tomorrow, and the couple wants to get baptized, so I've got to go up to Blues Creek tomorrow and baptize them right after the wedding. Oh Hallelujah. I'm like, whoo, Jesus, I need a wetsuit. I, I need thermal wetsuit or something. Hallelujah. Glory to God. They wanted to do it last week, but it was 42. I said, well, you know, guys, it's going to be 42 tomorrow. Hallelujah. I'm glad they decided for tomorrow. It's supposed to be 70 tomorrow, but I, it don't look like it today, does it? All right. How, how does... This, how does the ministry of Jesus relate to us? Let's look here. Each of his anointings of Jesus directly affect the threefold redemption in our lives. Uh, justification, sanctification, and glorification. His justification was in line with his earthly ministry. He came to just When Jesus first appeared, it was for what? It was for our justification. Say, Jesus came to justify us. Hallelujah. Now, just uh, the, old, the old folks used to say uh, the word justify, we could translate this way, just as if I'd never sinned. Hallelujah. When you've been justified, it's just as if I'd never sinned. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Glory to God. You've been decreed, declared righteous through the earthly ministry of, ministry of Jesus. Hallelujah. As Tim, Titus 2, 11 through 13 says, For the grace that of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all. That was his prophet's ministry. Um, teaching us. Woo, that's a mess up some grace, folk. I believe in grace. I don't believe in crazy grace. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. God mess up folks and say you can do anything you want to and get away with it. And it just don't matter. You know, it does matter. See, that's, you know, and that's Jesus' ministry today. He's high priest over your life, and he, he's, he's, he's working in what we refer to as sanctification. Amen. Glory to God. And we'll get back to that in a little while. And then... Um, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is his returning as King of kings and Lord of lords. So Titus 2, 11 and 13 covers the prophets, priestly, and kingly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it actually gives us insight into those ministries and how they relate to us. When Jesus first appeared, it's for our justification. Romans 3, 24 says, being justified freely by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now understand that you are born again, you are redeemed, you are saved because Jesus came and became sin for you who knew no sin. Amen. In his earthly ministry, he walked out the plan of God, paid the price for man's sin, and was raised from the dead. He did that in order to justify you. He did not come for a vacation. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Can y'all hear me out there? Can you, can you hear me? All right, just make sure you can hear me. Hallelujah. He came to redeem us. Glory to God. He entered in once and for all with his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Can you say amen? So Jesus' earthly ministry, his prophet's ministry, the ministry of walking in the supernatural, ministering and speaking of the coming kingdom. See, he kept talking about the coming kingdom. Remember, he said this, In that day you'll ask me nothing. But whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it for you or give it you. Amen. So he came fulfilling the old covenant, speaking of the new to come, bridging the gap in between, paying the price for man's sin, being judged for our sin, and then raised from the dead for our justification. Glory to God. Amen. And so that, that, he, that was his prophet, prophet's ministry. <clears throat> he is not operating in that ministry today. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now, see, some folks get stuff mixed up. Um, you know, Jesus healed. Now, we, we asked Jesus to heal us. And honestly, that's not a biblical, biblical prayer. Why? He's already done he's all he's going to do about your healing. It's a matter of receiving it by faith. Lord, save me. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, that's, that's not even biblical. I know we pray that. And God, God, God looks over semantics because he looks at the heart. But honestly, you don't get saved. You know, you're not, he's not saving you today. Anybody gets born again, you just accepted what he already did at Calvary. Amen. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he paid the price for your sin. He also took your sickness and disease and took the, pain, took the penalty for your, your sick, sickness at the same time. Amen. So when we say Jesus is still healing today, what we really mean is people are still receiving the benefit of what he did. So, you know, you got, because you got people come on saying, Jesus don't heal anymore. Well, if he don't heal anymore, he don't save anymore. Amen? Amen? Why? Because it's a matter of faith. Amen? If God's not saving folk, uh, if God's not healing folk, if people aren't getting healed because of the, the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then they're not getting saved. Are you here? You've gone home. How many are here? All right, four of you have already gone home. You're sitting right here and you don't even know it. You left the building. Did you leave with Elvis? I want to know. <laughs> Elvis has left the building. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Nope. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, functioned as the prophet. He had the anointing of the prophet. Remember we talked about when we started this, that only three people had the, the anointing in the Old Covenant. That was the prophet, priest, and the king. That's why the, the, that, that's why the children of Israel had to go to the priest to get their sins forgiven because they didn't have that anointing on them. Now you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Amen. Glory to God. So we can go to God for ourselves. Hallelujah. Amen. 
And actually, that's that scripture says, you know, he's made us kings and priests unto our God. If you study that out in the Greek, it really says he's made us a kingdom of priests. Not kings and priests. We're a kingdom of priests. Hallelujah. We, we all have access to the Father. We have a kingdom where everybody that comes into it has access to the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you shout glory? glory. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so we, we, we have here that when he first appeared, he came for our justification. He paid the price for our sin. Became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And it's all available to us now. So when you people get born again today, they say, well, I just got saved on July 11th. You know, my testimony, I got saved July 11th, 1979, the first Pentecostal Holiness Church at the corner of Brinkley Road and Plaza Drive. It was a Wednesday night at about 7.45 p.m. Hallelujah. On the left side of the altar. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we had a, we were a Pentecostal Holiness Church, but we had a Baptist altar. I mean, I, you, if you look at our, our, our Pentecostal Holiness Church at that time, it looked like a Baptist uh, sanctuary. Red carpet, white, red with, I mean, you, used, you could just put back first Baptist church out there and you would felt comfortable. But that's what it looked like, you know, just everybody's got their own look, the charismatic look, no, no altar. Amen. Hallelujah. That's going to change, though. And when we build a building, I'm putting in a place to pray. We're taking out the seats. Anyone? No. <laughs> we'll give the preacher a seat. That's how Jesus did. It would be scriptural. Jesus sat down, they stood up. Think about it now. We got to have light shows, smoke shows. I mean, we got to have uh, vibrate massaging seats with leg rest. We got to have this. We got to have that. We got to have a rock climbing wall. And in, that, in those days, they'd follow Jesus around, go out there with any food. He had to supernaturally feed them because they went out three so far away from any food. I mean, there weren't even a, 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 a subway nearby. Hello? Are y'all here? You gone home? And then he'd sit down. They'd all stand up. How do you know? Because when, when he did the feeding of the 5,000, he said, have them sit down in groups. <laughs> They're all standing up listening to him preach. Man, if most folks had to come to church and stand up, they walked, I ain't going to that church. I can't even believe they, they're so poor they don't even have chairs for the people to sit in. That went over big. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something. When you're hungry and thirst for righteousness, you'll go wherever. Wherever the word, the good word of God is, or where the anointing is, that'll, that'll, that'll liberate you and set you free. Can you say amen? amen? So when Jesus finished his earthly ministry, he, and when he went to the cross and paid the price, shed his blood, took his own blood into the mercy seat of God, put it on there, came back. You know, remember, remember Mary couldn't touch him. She caught him on the way up. Remember, actually, she, the King James says, touch me not. The Greek says, clutch me not. Right there. Remember when she came to him, she saw him, she started talking to him, and she said, Master, and she reached, she grabbed him, he said, and the King James says, touch me not, but the Greek says, clutch me not. Why? Because I've not yet ascended to my father and your father, to my God and your God. What? He wasn't done. He hadn't taken his, she, she got him on the way up, and he hadn't taken his blood into the Holy of Holies yet and put it on the mercy seat to fulfill and finish what God had to be done. So it wasn't, you got to let go, I, I got I to finish. See, I've had that experience before. I went, I was leaving one time to go to, go to, um, 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 well, Estonia or Czech Republic or somewhere, and uh, the kids were there, and uh, Nathan got on one foot. That's back when you could still go down to the gates. Nathan sat down on one foot and grabbed my leg. Shannon sat down on the other foot and grabbed that leg, and J Jesse stood over there leaning on Mama's shoulder. Everybody's crying, and I'm trying to go to the gate like this. <laughs> kind of hard to get on a plane like that. You understand what I'm talking about? I mean, they don't want Daddy to go. You know, it's kind of hard to get on a plane, and they're going to be gone for two weeks overseas when your kids are doing that to you. Oh, my. Hallelujah. Then I look over at Jesse. She's just Anyway, <clears throat> clutch me not. Jesus had to go in and put his blood on the mercy seat. But when he finished that, he came back and said, touch me. Put your finger. Told, uh, told Thomas, put your fingers in my palms. Stuck your hand in my side. For spirit hath not, flesh and, hath not flesh and bone. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So he, he had to finish it. When he finished that, though, his work, as far as the plan of redemption, was done. Jesus didn't get off the, the throne, coming back down here and dying for somebody to get saved today. He's made provision. So in other words, it's already provided for. His work in the arena of provision is done. There's not any more sacrifice for sin. It's already been saved. It's already been settled. See, and that's where people get mixed up. 
they'll come along and they'll, they'll get, a hold of, get a hold of that in a little bit, get a little bit of light in that arena, and they'll say, well, everybody's already saved. No. It may be, a, it may already, the, price, the price may already be paid, but if you do not accept or receive that, it does you no good. There is no benefit to you unless you receive it by faith. Now, the provision's there, but if you do not access it, it does you no good. How I many of this? If I put 25, uh, Dick, if I go over to that bank this afternoon and put $25,000 in your bank account, it's there. <laughs> but guess what? If you don't write a check or if you don't access that, it does what? Nothing. It was there. Has access to it. But you've got to act on it. Amen? Salvation is the same thing. You've got to act on it. Well, how do you know? Because we've got plenty of Scripture that tells us that. That if you, look, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God's raised from the dead, you shall be saved. In other words, the, the act of faith <clears throat> releases what was already provided. There is provision. I mean, we, we have um, uh, oil reserves, what they call strategic oil reserves. Remember Reagan wanted to pump, pump oil back in the ground in the empty oil wells. We just buy oil and pump it back in the ground in, in the event that we had a, a situation where uh, there was no oil anywhere. We could pump out the strategic oil reserves and we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be caught in a situation where we had no oil. Amen? It's there. It's sitting there. But you know what? Prices keep going up, and they'll threaten every once in a while. They'll release a little bit, and the prices will come down. But they, don't tap, they just don't normally tap into that. That reserve is there in the, in, in whenever there's a man made on it. Salvation has been, has been settled. There is, a, there is a salvation reserve. But unless you make a demand on it, it will do you no good. So people have to believe what Jesus has provided for them. Now, the same thing is true about healing. I hear, hear people say stuff like, well, if God just chose not to heal them, well, then, you know, does God choose not to save people? Now, come on now. Honestly, God's not willing that any should perish, but all, all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, we yet still know that the Scripture talks about people going to hell. They're casting out of darkness with us, weeping and gnashing teeth. Now, it's got not God's will to do, so God's will doesn't automatically make it so, does it? It may be God's will that everybody gets saved, but everybody's not going to get saved. Why? Now, can you imagine the, the torment of hell through eternity, knowing provision was made not to go there, yet you rejected it and still went there? And had to live with that, live with that, not exist with that knowledge through eternity that there was provision made. I didn't have to come here, but I came here because I rejected the provision. That's hell, that's hell enough. Being banished from the presence of God is hell enough by itself without the torment and the weeping and gnashing of teeth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Y'all hear you going home. All right. But the provision has been made for all mankind. God's not willing that any should perish. So I, I, talk, I get talked to people sometimes about healing. They'll say, well, you know, maybe the Lord chose not to heal them. I can't, I can't accept that premise. Why? He thought healing was so important, physical healing was so important to humanity that at the same time, same time Jesus bore our sin, he became our sickness on the cross. It was just as imperative to God. Why? Because God made man's spirit, soul, and body. He doesn't want Satan to have inroads anywhere. Amen. You look at Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. And it goes on list several other wonderful things. Amen? It's good stuff. I mean, there's a lot of bunch of good things. But notice, I was listening to one of the, at the time, one of the most um, well-known evangelists. He was a Baptist guy that got born again. I'm mean, not born again. He was already born again as Baptist. But he got filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, you know, I, you know he, he came out and started hanging around the Charismatics and uh, got on the Christian television networks preaching. I mean, listen, he was a good preacher before he got filled with the Holy Ghost. He was, you know, wow, when he got filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I mean, he had a, had a wonderful reputation before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then he got even wilder after he got the baptism. He was on the talk show one night, and they were talking, and he preached on, you know, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Boy, he went off. You know, that, that, 
That, that salvation message was in him. Uh, he preached and he lit up all the phone banks. They were getting stacks of salvations. They were calling in. I mean, just, I mean, just on and on. And he's just preaching Jesus loves you no matter what you've done. You're a prostitute. You're a, you're a pimp. You're a drug addict. I mean, you're a murderer. God will forgive you. God sent Jesus. Shed, his blood was shed to redeem you. Glory to God. And I'm telling you, man, people were just calling up, getting those counselors, getting saved right and left. Right? I mean, just, I mean, calling in and getting, receiving Jesus. Out of you. And after everything kind of calmed down for a little while, he looked over at the host now. He says, now the second half of that verse says, who healeth all thy diseases. And he looks at him and says, you know, he don't heal all your diseases. And I thought, where would you get that from? You just spent 30 minutes preaching like a crazy man how that God forgives all your iniquities. Get past the semicolon, and all of a sudden, all don't mean all. I mean, Honestly. He says, you know, he don't always heal all your diseases. See, and there's a lot of folk like that. Let me tell you why. They've seen people not get healed. And because it's something they can see with their eyes, it, it, they, they use that experience to determine their doctrine. Listen, there are people who don't get saved. But see, you can't see an unsaved spirit. So you don't have that correlation in your thinking, the experience to be able to see somebody not get saved and go to hell I mean, you may, well, you know, uh, like, you know, you go to some funerals and hear people standing around talking, man, I'm going to tell you what, he just busted hell wide open. And you ever been to a funeral like that, people talking, standing around talking? You think, well, uh, buddy, you better get saved yourself, you know? I mean, you know, how do you know? Well, I know how he lived. But you don't know what he said the last second before he let, stepped into eternity. He could have said, Jesus, be my Lord, and out of here he went. Well, God, do that? Ask the guy on the cross. He slipped in, as we used to say, by the skin of his teeth. Of course, there's no skin on your teeth, so I don't know how, I'm not sure how close of a shave that is, but it's pretty close. Hey, man, are you here? You all right, Janice? You want know the Holy Ghost? That one, the Holy Ghost? She's about to freeze. All right, we can turn, the, turn it back. Glory to God. Hallelujah. At least she was honest. She could have just gone, thank you, Lord. And I thought we had a move of the Spirit. All right. <clears throat> the man on the cross, you know, got, got in by the skin of his teeth, so to speak. But see, we, have, we can't see spirits. We can't see if they're born again or not born again. We judge by fruit. Amen. But see, even that is, sub, is subjective to our, our opinions a lot of times, what kind of fruit people have. But somebody that's sick, we can see that. And so because of that, we'll say, well, they, we, I heard and pray, God, heal me. Oh, Lord, I want to be well. I, I've, I've talked to people, too. I've tried, I've, you know, we've had some people, we've had people who prayed out of death, people we couldn't pray out of death. Some folks you just can't help. Why? They don't want help. What do you mean they don't want help? When you go to visit them in the hospital and they're dodging you to see as, a, as the stomach churns and the old and the relentless, Y'all know those are kind of sarcastic names for some of those soap operas. As the world turns and the young and the restless. Y'all remember those soap operas? Don't raise your hand. We'll know what you're doing on, in the mornings. Hallelujah. Amen. Or even let's go back to Dark Shadows. <laughs> Barnabas. <laughs> Hallelujah. That'll really date you, won't it? But you're sitting there trying to minister healing to them and they're going... Uh-huh. And you move over that way, and they move back this way. Uh-huh. And they don't get well. Well, the Lord must not. I mean, the pastor went up there and prayed for them. And they were saying they believe Jesus is going to heal them. No, they won't. They're just telling you what you wanted to hear. See, it's still a matter of faith. I said it's still a matter of faith. You've got to believe that you receive, then you shall have. If you're just giving lip service, there's, people, there's people, I've seen people say, look, everybody, everybody in the church, grab hands and repeat the prayer. Just because somebody repeats a prayer don't mean they're saved. You know what Jesus said in Mark 11, 23? Say, what, what's this got to do with the three-fold anointing of Jesus? We're talking about justification. Talk about that first one. He said, what things shall you desire when you pray? Believe. Believe. Mark 11, 23. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Amen? I'm sorry, 24. 
Who shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt, and start, shall believe the things he saith shall come to pass? He'll have whatsoever he saith. Now back up there. It says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt. Where? In his heart. But what? Shall believe that the things he saith shall come to pass. He'll have whatsoever he saith. Now stop there. Think about that. What happens if you don't believe what you're saying? You won't have it. I said, you won't have it. You can say it all day long, but if you don't believe it, you won't have it. A number of years ago, when we first came to Greensboro, there was a, we had a guy in the church, bless his heart. He, he tried, he, he called himself the next TL, but he, he, he wasn't TL, you know. He, he, he was probably one of the most manipulating people I've ever met in my life. He operated in a spirit of witchcraft. He, I mean, it was just, it was, and, I, and I called him on it, he left the church. Yeah, well, I can't help it. You're, you're operating that spirit, you know, manipulating people. Well, one Sunday morning, we show up, and there's this girl there and he had worked with. And I noticed at the service, she's over here crying. Well, you see, usually most charismatic go, oh, the spirit of conviction's on her. Nope. I kind of went over and just kind of stood around and kind of just nosied in. Not moseyed in, nosied in. <laughs> All right? Kind of just stood kind of talking, kind of, you know, listening. And he's over there trying to convince her she's saved. Well, you prayed the prayer. I don't want to be saved. I mean, she really, she wasn't. And so I just finally butted in. I nosed it in, then I butted in. I asked her, I said, did you mean it when you prayed it? No, I just prayed it because he's, he, he, so, he, oh, yes, you meant it. He said, no, how do you know she meant it? She's telling me she didn't mean it. She didn't mean it. See? But just because, see, it messed up his, his statistics. He led somebody to the Lord. Folks, they have to believe. Now, I'm going to tell you something, as a, as, a, as a Christian, your responsibility is not to get them saved, it's to go preach. Did you know that? It's your responsibility to go preach the gospel. It's theirs to be, accept, believe, receive, and act on it. The Holy Ghost is the one that's going to deal with them after they've heard, heard the gospel. You can't make them get saved. We got all kinds. I had, we had one guy in church, they, they took a group down to the juvenile detention center one time. And they had everybody come up. They all stood here. And they said, if you want to reject Jesus Christ, take a step backwards. They could, Everybody got saved. The Bible doesn't say he does not reject Jesus Christ shall be saved. It says if you'll confess him as Lord, you'll be saved. Amen. It was just a, it's another, it was another cute little manipulation tactic to convince people they're saved when they're not. Now you got people going through it. See, we can't do that kind of stuff. No. Faith is of the heart. And salvation is a matter of faith. Jesus came to supply or provide a means for our justification. It's still a matter of faith on our part. We must receive. We must accept. We must confess his lordship. Now, healing, on the other hand, is, is still a matter of faith. Y'all hear you going home. Now, just, just uh, for clarification purposes, the word sozo in the Greek, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, the word saved comes from the Greek word sozo. Now, is it, now, you understand when we say these things, we speak a word and, and we say it's spelled S-O-Z-O. That's what we call a transliteral trans, uh, interpretation. In other words, we take an English letter and give it an equivalent to the Greek letter. And so we bring that down and we end up with words we can pronounce in English because we've transliteral transliterally translate them it's not the greek spelling or rendering of it in in greek letters it's the english rendering we used to pronounce it sozo so it's called a transliteral thing the word christ is is a transliteration of christos okay it's not jesus's last name christ means the anointed one all right so the word sozo in the greek it is an all-inclusive term and, and understand this that the word sozo is the verb in Greek, you translate the nouns according to the verb, which is opposite of English. In English, we get a noun, and then you translate the verb, or you get the meaning of the verb from the noun. That's how we do it in English. In, in Greek, you go to the verb, and then you get the meaning of the noun from the verb. The English word soterius, which is the word for salvation, is considered a part of the sozo word group, sozo being the verb. Now, the word sozo does mean to save. Yes, it does. But you know what it also means? To heal, to make whole, to deliver from temporal evils. Amen? It is an all-inclusive salvation term. 
Hallelujah. So whosoever is called on, upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Sozo. Well, you can call upon him and get born again. But you can also call upon him and get whole. You can all call upon him and be healed. Amen. Amen. Now, <coughs> remember over in James where it says, if there any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and they'll come, the, 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 the anointing of the Lord the prayer of faith shall save the sick. It's not talking about getting born again. It's sozo. It means heal the sick. So heal the sick. And that's why. Because that word is inclusive. Jesus paid the price for your sin. At the same time, he paid the price for your salvation. We look at Isaiah chapter 53, 34 and 5. We look at 1 Peter 2, 24. You look at Matthew 8, 16 and 17. Combine all those together and you find out it's talking about the healing part is talking about physical healing. Some people don't believe that. Some people, well, you know, God knows what he's doing. He don't heal everybody. You know, well, let me say something. He already did. Just like he's already saved everybody, but the people that don't receive it, it's a matter of faith. They have to receive by faith. The work has been done. I mean, how many remember that song we used to sing in the church? Reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by. You'll find he's not too busy to hear your hearts cry. How many remember that song? Raise your hand if you remember that song. One, two, three, four. What about the rest of you folks? You ain't heard that song? Good. Jesus doesn't get it well by anymore. Hello? You don't have to reach out and touch him as he's passing by. Now, I, listen, I'm, I understand. I know, I know, I know. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. It's still a matter of faith in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We receive what he's already done by faith. And God's not sitting up there going with lottery numbers. Well, you know what? I'm just not going to heal Dick today because I'm God. I'm sovereign. I can do what I want to do. And today is my day that Dick don't get healed. And he's just going to have to figure out why. Because there's some unknown, secretive, sovereign reason I'm not going to heal him, and it's going to work for his good. See, we take that scripture, all things work together for good to them that love God, who are called according to his purpose, and make it out that, you know, every bad thing happens to everybody. That, you go, that's just not the context. I said, that's not the context. Hello? My wife getting run over by a tractor trailer doesn't work for my good. And it really didn't work for her good. <laughs> Hello, you got to take things within the context of how they're spoken and in the weight of other scripture. Now, all the things that God's working in my life, all the things that I'm, I'm seeking after him, all the things out of his word, those are all working for my good. Are you here or you're going home? How many are still here? How many left? Anybody else left with Elvis? All right. All right. All right. All right. Still here. All right. Hallelujah. So Jesus came for our justification. He paid the price at the cross. He died for us. He, said he carried our sins. He carried your sicknesses. At the same time. Listen, my kids were in school one day in, in, in high school with, in, in a Bible class, and they had kids, and they're going, God makes women prostitutes because he's got a bigger plan. He commands you not to do something, and then he makes you do it. We have a word for that here. Crazy. I get amazed at how many people will say that God does things that we have mental health disease names for here. And say, but he's God, he, he knows what he's doing. Well, why don't we say that people who run around and blow up uh, buildings and kill 300 people knew what they were doing. They had a higher plan. No, we, we, we gas them. We electrocute them. We put them in prison. Why? Because we say they're not safe for society. Hello? Well, God killed, killed somebody to, to do this. Really? But God says if you, if you follow his word, you'll have length of days. You notice we live in a bad world with a bad devil, with evil people. Bad things happen to bad people because there's a bad devil, not because God has some ulterior motive. We live in a fallen world. And we're walking in that world, and we're putting on the whole armor of God that we can stand. We're learning the word of God so we can win, win battles over the devil. Amen. 
But God's not got some secret initiative, some subversive plan that he wants to take you out simply because, and you, and you never find out why. Have you noticed that? He's teaching me something. What have you learned? I don't know, but I'll find out one day. Well, I died and went to heaven. I got the ultimate healing. No, you didn't get healed. You died. Your body died. You didn't get healed. Come on now. These are terminologies we use. Why don't we just say they got the ultimate, uh, ultimate salvation? They died unsaved. They've left this earth. We don't use that term that way, do we? Why? Because it doesn't make sense, does it? So an, uh, an unsaved person die, and they, and, we, and they walk out and say they got the ultimate salvation. No, they didn't. They went to hell. They got the ultimate healing. They went to heaven. Well, they didn't go with their body. Their body's still here. And it's decayed in the ground. They're coming back with the Lord to pick it up and get a glorified body. Praise God. There is ultimate redemption. But you got to understand, let's stop talking, double talking and stuff that messes people up. Healing is a matter of faith. Jesus paid the price for our sicknesses and our diseases and our injuries and went to the cross. And there is a way to receive help and healing from that. And it's the same way you got born again, through the act of faith. I said through the act of faith. Y'all hear you going home. That price was paid. His, prophet, his prophetical ministry applies to us in this way. He has made provision for you. Now, not, only, not only sickness and not only hell, I mean, uh, uh, spiritual salvation, though he was rich, yet he was made poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. And here come the bozos. Oh, that's talking about spiritual wealth. No, that's the new birth. Hello. Oh, they're talking about, I mean, we start talking about healing. Oh, that's talking about spiritual healing. No, I got born again. The Word of God says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things became new. And he's talking about your spirit, not your, not your soul, and not your body. How do you know? Because he tells us in Romans 12 to renew our minds to the Word of God. And he tells us to make our bodies a living sacrifice. And he provided healing for the body. Amen. What gets, what gets transformed? Your spirit gets transformed. Your spirit does not get healed. It gets born again. Jesus even said, if the man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And we need to get our doctrine straight in the church. Oh, I, I believe in spiritual healing. That, 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 I tell you what a lot of that is. is a bunch of psychologists got saved and started using their techniques of Freud, Freud, Freudistic, Freudism, Freudism to counsel Christians and they start coming up with what they call spiritual healing. Your spirit don't get healed. And your mind, listen, your mind gets restored or renewed. Think about that now. Receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save so down. Now listen, so is your soul, but word also means to make whole. The mind becomes whole by restoration or renewing. It doesn't get healed, and it doesn't get born again. It gets restored. He restoreth my soul. Amen? Amen? Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of of your mind see the mind gets renewed or restored that you may prove is that good perfect and acceptable will of god transform metamorpho in the greek a metamorphosis of the soul the mind is the seat is with a soul the seat of emotions and will and intellect is your mind needs to get fixed notice jesus said in mark eleven twenty three 23 that if you believe in your heart not your head anybody ever has faith in your heart and your head is going oh my oh my I have. whole time you're doing, your head's going, Woo! oh my, what am I going to do? Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And your heart says, shut up. We got this. If Peter had shut his head up, he'd been all right. It won't no big deal that Peter walked on water. There were planks under it. I'm being facetious. One guy one time from some theological seminary yeah, that's why we start calling theological cemetery. It's a professor at a theological cemetery. He said it won't no big deal that children of Israel crossed over the Red Sea. It was only six inches deep there. See, when you're dumb, you don't carry your thoughts to conclusion. 
because the whole Egyptian army, horses and all, drowned in six inches of water. So it's a miracle no matter how you look at it. <laughs> and, then, and, and then they said, it wasn't any big deal that Jesus fed the 5,000 with two loaves and five, I mean, with uh, two, two fishes and five loaves of bread. He said the loaves of bread were bigger in those days. Yeah, what do you do? Bring Moby Dick and his wife to dinner? 5,000 people have two fish and five loaves. Loaves were bigger in those days. Now, listen, I've been a lot of places and seen a lot of big ovens. I ain't seen a lo oven yet that cook one loaf of bread to feed 1,000 people. Besides women and children. And you know, then women can put down the food. Anyway. You know what I, you know what I like about being the pastor? You've got to love the pastor and forgive him. You don't like your food? Yeah. But many don't burn no chicken unless you got money in the mail. Hallelujah. If you saw the help, he said, why don't we just burn the chicken? He said, many don't burn no chicken. I'm with her. Don't want to burn no chicken. Fried chicken. Anybody getting hungry yet? I can, I can go on. I can go on. Hallelujah. Praise God. Romans 5, 9, much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Jesus came to deliver us from the wrath to come. He paid the price. He made provision for it. And it's a matter of faith that we receive the justification work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I would say tonight, but we're not going to be here tonight. So log in on your, on your YouTube and pastor will be preaching on the Internet. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Hallelujah. We'll be taking your, your square cards over the Internet. We'll, just do, we'll do a whole a virtual church service. Hallelujah. Now, the funny thing is, I got a pastor in Africa who, who wrote us and said he shows our services to his congregation. He's preaching to his church through our services. He just replays them over there. Well, go ahead on, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. We love you guys. Amen. You're blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. Where, where are they? I don't, they're in Africa somewhere. I ain't, we, you, know, you get emails. You can't track those things back. I got a phone call. My answer machine. Uh, this is so-and-so from the Philippines. How about calling back on this number? I'm going, and the number is, oh, I'm in the spirit today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Going to get in the spirit. Hallelujah. Next time we're together, we'll talk about our sanctification, which is the ongoing work. See, being healed, being saved is a matter of faith. But then you have something to do after that. Now, your body, your spirit is sanctified. In other words, the word sanctification means to be separate or to separate or to, to separate from. Your spirit gets separated from ungodliness in the world when you get born again, but your flesh don't. You don't believe that? No, don't try this. <laughs> There's just, like, just don't have any experience. You've already, you, you probably already know from experience that if you let your flesh go, it will do stuff it shouldn't do. Why? Because... It's still corruptible, and it's still death doomed. It's a, my, my, remember when Jesus comes back, this mortal shall put on immortality. It's this death doom shall put on non-death doom. This corruption put on incorruption in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, what do we have? Paul said we have to keep our body under, and we have to buffet it. Every, we have to buffet it. We have to keep it under. Keep it under. And then we have to present it as a living sacrifice to God, which is our spiritual service. King James says reasonable. That Greek word means spiritual. You know, offer your body as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual service. To keep your body under. Amen. So we're going to talk about sanctification in the sense. Now, listen, according to the Pentecostal, like I did, I was in one of the Pentecostal denominations that believe in sanctification as a second definite work of grace. So you get born again, and then you stay down the altar, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray. And then one day, you got holy, H W H O L L Y, sanctified. Sometimes it didn't last until you got to the parking lot. Amen. That's how's our doctrine. And so you got the other Pentecostal denominations believe in, you know, a sanctification of your spirit when you're born again, but then the flesh is an ongoing process. And let me tell you, it is an ongoing process with your flesh. You got to work with that thing. Not with it. You got to work over it. You got to be a taskmaster to your flesh. Because it'll do stuff you, you it'll surprise, well, it'll surprise other people what it'll do. But you know, E.W. Kenyon had a really interesting statement. In one of his books, he said, he said, the person who does not renew their mind to the word of God 
will imitate a sinner. They'll imitate a sinner. What's it mean? By not, by not renewing the mind to the Word of God and, not, and then thus, because of that, disciplining and controlling the flesh, your flesh, you'll let your flesh go do stuff it shouldn't be doing. Hello. Why do you think Satan fights so hard against the Word of God? Because he wants fleshly Christians. If he can't keep you from being saved, he wants you to be ineffective once you are. Thank you.